Hello, I'm Dr. William Schlosser, Washington State University School of the Environment. This is my classroom. Ecological facilitation, or probiosis, describes species interactions that benefit at least one of the participants and cause harm to neither. Facilitations can be categorized as mutualisms, in which both species benefit, or commensalisms, in which one species benefits and the other is unaffected. Interspecific competition in ecology is a form of competition in which individuals of different species compete for the same resources in an ecosystem such as food or living space. This can be contrasted with mutualism, a type of symbiosis. Recognize characteristics of how plants and animals interact to discover that while there are predators and prey, there are countless other forms of plant and animal life interactions. Some help one another, some benefit one while not affecting the other, and some benefit only the instigator. Be able to see the interactions to label and understand how and why they interact. This is seeded in restrictive environments and each species capability to adapt through generations and eons. All wildlife need food, water, solar energy, air, and space. The species ability to successfully fill its niche will establish its presence on the earth community. This means competition for these land-based resources is persistent. Some successfully succeed by teaming with other organisms. This happens at all levels from the microclimate, community, macroclimate, ecosystem, landscape, and biome. We have tapped into this definition already to know that sometimes cooperation and competition happen within a species group, and other times between competing species. Ecological facilitation, or probiosis, describes species interactions that benefit at least one of the participants and cause harm to neither. Facilitations can be categorized as mutualisms, in which both species benefit, or commensalisms, in which one species benefits and the other is unaffected. The interaction among organisms within or between overlapping niches can be characterized into five types of relationships. Competition, predation, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. Mutualism involves a close, mutually beneficial interaction between two different biological species, whereas cooperation is a more general term that can involve looser interactions and can be interspecific, that is, between species or intraspecific within a species. Male ants live for one purpose, they can fly and mate once, then they're dead. The rest of the story is about female ants. Workers, defenders, food seekers, all of them are female ants. I guess that is why they are not called uncles. <laughs> uh, okay, Disney made this into a human likeness movie. The big guy and the princess like to act, but that is not the insect world. Yeah. <laughs> okay, mama. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Oh, yeah. Big guy coming through. <laughs> Love it. Hey, hey, hey. Take it easy, muscles. You're making the rest of us look bad. Ants, Formicidae, are the largest group of eosocial insects. Ant societies have cooperative brood care, overlapping generations living in the same nest, and a division of labor with reproductive and non-reproductive individuals, known generally as worker ants. With an estimated 10,000 trillions of individuals, they equal the global human biomass and constitute most of the animal biomass of rainforests. Key to their success are the myriad of interactions ants engage in with members of their own colony, other insects, fungi, microbes, and plants. 
These interactions have long been used as a system which to address evolutionary questions about mutualism, coevolution, adaptation, and animal communication. Because the ants get food and the aphid gets protection, both species benefit from the interactions. Ants also form mutualisms with plants. For example, by protecting plants from herbivores, cleaning parasitic fungi off the plant's leaves, or dispersing plant seeds. Mutualism, symbiosis that is beneficial to both organisms involved, is a common type of ecological interaction. Prominent examples include most vascular plants engaged in mutualistic interactions with mycorrhiza, flowering plants being pollinated by animals, vascular plants being dispersed by animals, and corals with zooxanthellae, among many others. Raoria fremonti, Fremont's horseshoe lichen, Unesia lapicana, bearded lichen, Lotharia vulpine, wolf lichen, and Parmelia sulcata, shield lichen, are all participants in this realm of cooperation. A lichen is an organism that results from a mutualistic relationship between a fungal and a photosynthetic organism. The other organism is usually a cyanobacterium or green algae. The fungus grows around the bacterial or algal cells. The fungus benefits from the constant supply of food produced by the photosynthesizer. A lichen consists of a simple photosynthesizing organism, usually a green algae or cyanobacterium, surrounded by filaments of a fungus. Generally, most of the lichen's bulk is made from the interwoven fungal filaments. The part of a lichen that is not involved in reproduction, the body or the vegetative tissue of a lichen, is called the thallus. The thallus form is very different from any other form where the fungus or alga are growing separately. The thallus is made up of filaments of the fungus called hyphae. The filaments grow by branching then rejoining to create a mesh, which is called being anastromos. The mesh of the fungus filaments may be dense or loose. Remember, Lichens are not plants. The name Ectomycorrhiza, abbreviated ECM, means approaching from outside, fungus and root. It is the form of symbiotic relationship that occurs between a fungus symbiont and the roots of various plant species. Mycorrhiza are fungi, another non-plant participant, which forms a mutualistic relationship with the plants it joins. This relationship benefits the plants by converting nutrients from other plants, moisture from the ground, and even defense warnings from other plants of the same species. Mycorrhiza are the original internet connection. Mycorrhizal symbioses are intimate associations between two unrelated organisms. Mycorrhiza are very common but largely unseen symbiosis between plant roots and fungi that are important in plant nutrition community structure, and nutrient cycling. The roots need to be in direct contact with the soil to absorb the nutrients. But plant roots only grow so small. Mycorrhiza help plants protect against diseases and toxins. Mycorrhiza can extend the rooting reach of one or several plants by a factor of 100 times. It can connect different plant species together. Mycorrhiza benefit by streaming away some of the nutrients that the plants enable, such as nitrogen from the soil and carbon capture during photosynthesis. The fungus has no sunlight exposure, so it cannot photosynthesize. It gets the benefit from this mutualistic association. This story came from New Zealand, telling of tree stumps that self-grafted with surrounding trees. Ah. Their determination made no mention of mycorrhizal symbiosis. <laughs> Listen to this. Quote, A tree stump that should be dead, but isn't, has been discovered in the forests of New Zealand. The kare tree stump appears to be surviving by feeding on its neighbor's resources, holding onto their roots, and extracting water from them. Huh. Two researchers from Auckland University of Technology were hiking when they came across the odd tree stump. They decided to study the nearby trees to find out how it was being kept alive. Their findings, published in iScience, revealed the tree roots of the stumps were grafted to the trees surrounding it. Hmm. With the movement of the water between them and the stump having a strong negative correlation as the surrounding trees lost water, the stump gained it. End quote.
Through my private natural resource consulting firm, D&D Lyrics LLC, my wife and I were completing some forestry work for a Canadian forest management firm in Nanaimo, Vancouver Island, Canada, in 2013. When we took a walk one evening through the Provincial Forestland Park, we passed an area where about five Douglas fir trees had been cut and taken away. We looked at them to see that each tree had grown bark over the cut tree bowl. Huh? Their new bark was thick. There were places where the bark had scars that were healing. These stumps were alive. It took only a cursory look through the area to see the mycorrhiza were connecting the trees together. The cut trees needed new nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus, and potassium to heal. The network got on it, and it saved the tree stumps to live another day. These trees were cut in about 2005, eight years prior. The stumps were living through the interroot network. Trees with branches were photosynthesizing. The roots pulled moisture loaded with nitrogen to form new chloroplasts. They shared these resources with the connected stumps because they needed them. This was all enabled through the mycorrhizal network. This is mutualism and symbiosis in their purest forms. It is a wonderful time to capture details of phenomena that shake the world as we know it. Pinus abacalis, known by the common name of white bark pine, pitch pine, Scrub pine and creeping pine is a conifer tree native to the mountains of the western United States and Canada, specifically subalpine areas of Sierra Nevada, Cascade Range, Pacific Coast Ranges, and the Rocky Mountains from Wyoming northward. The whitebark pine is typically the highest elevation pine tree found in these mountain ranges and often marks the tree line. Thus, it is often found as crumholes trees growing close to the ground that have been dwarfed by excessive wind exposure. In more favorable conditions, the trees may grow to 29 meters, that's 95 foot in height. These high elevation white bark pine cones and their seeds do not have any wings and therefore cannot be effectively dispersed by the wind. Dispersal of these seeds is facilitated by birds, most notably the Clark's nutcracker, Nucafragra columbiana. Birds of this species peck at the cones while they are still on the tree and extract the seeds. The birds can eat the seeds right then, or they can put up to 150 seeds at a time in the pouch on the floor of their mouth. With the seeds in their pouch, the birds can transport the seeds up to 22 kilometers away and bury them in small caches of 3 to 5 seeds each, on average, to be retrieved and then eaten later. In a year with good seed production, a bird may cache up to 25,000 to 35,000 seeds and recovers many of those seeds by means of a remarkable spatial memory. Seeds in caches that are not retrieved may germinate to form clusters of seedlings. The tree gets its seed dispersal. Whitebark pine, like other stone pine trees, has co-evolved with Clark's nutcrackers. These nutcrackers rely on the stone pine seeds as their principal food source for at least nine months of the year and for raising their young. In addition to special adaptations for gathering, transporting, caching, and relocating hoarded seeds, the whole annual cycle of the nutcracker's life, its mating system, and its habitat use are adjusted to the use of pine seeds. Moreover, since the whitebark pine's cones do not open at maturity, Seed hoarding and caching by the nutcracker and other related birds, like jays, constitute the only dispersal and propagation mechanism available to this pine. Throughout the year, Clark's nutcracker birds migrate up or down mountain sides as food becomes available. Starting off in the high country, they begin eating white bark pine seeds around mid-July and start caching them in mid-August. The birds gradually travel down slope to find ponderosa pine, limber pine, and Douglas fir seeds in the fall. They also eat insects, berries, mice, and carrion. The year-round Montana residents winter in mid to low elevation forests. Courtship begins as early as December, and the female generally lays her eggs in March, earlier than any other songbird species. And by the way, all corvids are songbirds. The birds pair for life, 
and share duties incubating the eggs and feeding their two young to four offspring. Early nesting provides time for young birds to learn from their parents. As snow melts on open subalpine slopes in early June, the Clark's Neckcracker family migrates upward. Adults uncover the previous year's white bark pine seeds larder to feed the screaming, baying fledglings. By the time the new seed crop ripens in mid-July, the young will move on to collect and store their own food. Yeah, this is really a family business. Commensalism is an association between two organisms in which one benefits and the other derives neither benefit nor harm. The cattle egret, Babolcus ibis, forages in pastures and fields among livestock, such as cattle and horses, feeding on the insects stirred up by the movement of the grazing animals. Egrets benefit from the arrangement, but the livestock generally do not. However, as in most cases of commensalism, there is a but. Cattle egrets have been observed perching on the top of cattle, picking off ticks, hmm. lending a slight tinge of mutualism to the arrangement. Coral Corporation cattle egrets are officially from Africa, where they were adapted to following the large herds of herbivores as they moved across the savanna. They first appeared in South America in the 19th century and have since spread to the eastern United States and California. The cattle egret breeds in colonies near water, as most herons do, but feeds almost exclusively with herds of cows and horses. This is commensalism at work. Commensalism includes relationships where one of the organisms benefits greatly from the symbiosis. The other is not helped, but is not harmed or damaged from the relationship. In other words, this is a one-sided symbiotic relationship. Commensalism is sometimes hard to prove because in any other symbiotic relationship, the likelihood that a very closely associated organism has no effect whatsoever on the other organism is rather unlikely. But there are few examples where commensalism does appear to exist. The benefits to be gained in a commensal relationship can be transportation, nutrition, protection, or a variety of other benefits. Commensalism refers to a relationship between two different organisms in different species in which one organism is damaged or destroyed while the other remains unaffected. In competition, a stronger organism may keep a weaker organism out of a living space or deprive it of food. In antibiosis, one of the organisms is damaged or killed by a chemical secretion from the other. An example of aminalism is a relationship between the bread mold penicillin and a variety of bacteria. The secretion given by the mold penicillin destroys many bacteria, hence its use in antibiotics. Another example is the black walnut, which secretes a chemical called juglone, which destroys most other plants in its root zone. A non-chemical example of aminalism is when trees' branches fall off. The branches falling to the ground cause damage to the smaller plants beneath them. There are two types of aminalism, competition and antagonism, or antibiosis. Competition is where a larger or stronger organism deprives a smaller or weaker one from resources. Antagonism occurs when one organism is damaged or killed and another through a chemical secretion. An example of competition is a sapling growing under the shadow of a mature tree. The mature tree can rob the sapling of necessary sunlight, and if the mature tree is very large, it can take up the rainwater and deplete soil nutrients. Throughout the process, the mature tree is unaffected by the saplings. Indeed, if the sapling dies, the mature trees gain nutrients from the decaying sapling. Competition is a natural occurrence between organisms occupying the same space at the same time. Thus, competition can occur between these organisms of the same species or between organisms of a different species. An example among animals could be the case of cheetahs and lions. Since both species feed on similar prey, they are negatively impacted by the presence of the other because they will have less food. However, they still persist together, despite the prediction that under competition one will displace the other. Competition is a situation in which two or more groups are trying to get something which not everyone can have. 
By classifying these effects, ecologists have derived five major types of species interactions predation, competition, mutualism, commensalism, and amenalism. Predation, where one wins and one loses. Competition, the double negative. Amenalism, competition and antagonism. Mutualism, everybody wins. And commensalism, a positive zero interaction event. Arguably, the strongest interactions between populations are those that enhance fitness of individuals in one population, the predator or parasite, while decreasing fitness of individuals in the other population, that is, the prey or the host. As a rule, such interactions occur between species at different trophic levels. This is in direct contrast to interspecific competition, which occurs primarily between species within the same trophic level. Territorial competition happens between adjacent wolf packs, between coyote packs or between members of the same species, which are grouped into their living units. These are interspecific competition events. Interspecific competition, when different species compete for the same resources, are seen when participants are looking for food or living space. This happens when packs of wolves strike out territorial dominance over a pack of coyotes. We have been looking into groups of predators. Intraspecific competition is an interaction in population ecology where members of the same species compete for limited resources. This leads to a reduction in fitness for both individuals, but the more fit individual survives and is able to reproduce. Interspecific competition is a form of competition in which individuals of different species compete for the same resources in an ecosystem. Oftentimes, these species occupy the same environments. They compete with each other for the same prey that they eat. Sometimes, competition between predators is insignificant, like between a coyote and a wolf. Coyotes often hunt alone or in groups of two, while the wolf comes in as a pack. They can take down a bison, elk, and of course a deer. On the other hand, the coyote will make clinic out of some rabbits, a pheasant, a vole. Sometimes they can take a deer fawn as a team. Their direct competition with others in this predator crowd is rare. However, other predators will move to keep them out of their squad's cafe. Now take a look at the cougar, Puma Concolor. This top-level predator can take down a deer, elk, or moose. They try to pounce from above, an aerial attack that's second to none. Being a successful generalist predator, cougars eat any animal it can, from insects to large ungulates weighing over 500 kilograms or 1,100 pounds. Like other cats, it's an obligate carnivore, meaning it must eat meat to survive. Its most important prey are various deer species, you know, mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and even Shrasi moose at Kamiak Butte. Males are generally 53 to 100 kilograms, that's 117 to 220 pounds, averaging about uh, 68 kilograms, or 150 pound. Females typically weigh between 29 and 64 kilograms, that's 64 and 141 pounds, averaging 55 kilograms, or 121 pound. They can take down a Sarasi moose weighing 230 to 340 kilograms. That's 507 to 758 pounds. The moose has a weight advantage of about five times more than the cougar. The cougar does this with a snap of the spinal column. Those sharp teeth puncture the spinal column and break it. Done deal. Giddy gets what it wants. Interactions between these carnivores is rarely made as predator prey. Interactions happen to defend territorial lands, for hunting and din sites. Cougars and bears will sometimes use the same rock shelters, but never at the same time. But territorialism can happen there. Ticks are small acronids, typically 3 to 5 millimeters long, part of the order of parasitiforms. Along with mites, they constitute the subclass Akari. Ticks are ectoparasites, meaning external parasites, living by feeding on the blood of mammals, birds, and sometimes reptiles and amphibians. Ticks had evolved by the Cretaceous period, the most common form of fossilization being immersed in amber. Ticks are widely distributed around the world, especially in warm, humid climates. They get around because their prey are mobile. 
A herbivore is an animal anatomically and psychologically adapted to eating plant material. For example, foliage or marine algae for the main component of its diet. As a result of their plant diet, herbivorous animals typically have mouthparts adapted to rasping or grinding. Horses and other herbivores have wide, flat teeth that are adapted to grinding grass, tree bark, and other tough plant material. These herbivores are autotrophs, eating at the plant consumption level. Saskatoon serviceberry, Amelanchier anifolia, is native to temperate regions of northern hemisphere, growing primarily in early successional habitats. It is most diverse taxonomically in North America, especially in the northeastern United States and adjacent southeastern Canada, and at least one species is native to every U.S. state except Hawaii and to every Canadian province and territory. A major source of complexity comes from the occurrence of hybridization, polyploidy, and apomixis, that is, asexual seed production, making this species difficult to characterize and identify. Here, it is seen at Kamiak Butte with the south-facing aspect. However, look closely at this shrub to see it is being browsed on heavily by the ungulates who live here. Mutualism between bird and tree, heavy wingless seed dispersed primarily by Clark's nutcrackers. Whitebark pine provides food to nutcrackers. The birds disperse tree seed, perpetuating the populations. Commensalism is the bird nesting in the tree. It is the lichen on the bark of the tree. Aminsalism, one participant harmed or impeded and the other is neutral or positively affected. Herbivores, carnivores, plants. There are three basic categories of exploitative or consumerism interactions. Predation, herbivory, and parasitism. These are the interactions you need to know. Recognize what the names mean and be ready to see interactions and apply the moniker to each event. As you look at any landscape, focus to see the plant communities. Recognize what types of interactions are happening here. You can see the difference between microclimatic energies. How do plants respond? Which wildlife are using it throughout the year? You know that here at Kamiak Butte, the sites receive the same precipitation and overall temperature. You know the differences are loaded on photosynthetically active radiation. We call it PAR. How are the plants responding? Look under those ponderosa pine trees. Pine needle carpet? What's up with that? Remember aminsalism, as one participant is harmed or impeded and the other is neutral or positively affected. We see pine grass, allowing moisture to enter the ground, but chemicals in the shed needles prevent other plants from germinating their seeds. This keeps the competition down. Winning participant is the ponderosa pine tree. The loser is all other species wanting to grow on this site. All other plants are losers? Well, take a longer look. Ventanata dubia is a non-native, invasive annual grass that has rapidly expanded in perennial grass systems, in disturbed areas and managed areas in the past hmm, two decades throughout the North American Pacific Northwest. Ventanata dubia is increasingly becoming a problem in natural systems where infestations can cause grass yield reductions of 50% or more within a few years. Besides hay, North Africa grass can invade bluegrass, alfalfa, small grains, and other crops. Besides displacing desirable foliage, Ventanata dubia contains a silica, making it a poor forage plant where animals, including cattle and wild ungulates, will not graze once inflorences have formed. North Africa grass is invading the native Palouse prairie, a threatened habitat in the Intermountain Pacific Northwest, remnants of which are located in eastern Washington and northern Idaho. North Africa grass's shallow root system may also cause soil to be prone to erosion over time. It can lead to decline of productivity and land conditions. Ventanata dubia is native to southern Europe, northern Africa, and the Middle East. It is becoming well known in North America where it is an introduced species and a noxious weed of cultivated and disturbed habitat. It is problematic in the Pacific Northwest where it was first identified in Washington in 1952 and in Idaho in 1957. It was found in Utah in 1996. 
It probably spreads when it gets mixed with grass seed and is transported and inadvertently planted. Its seeds can spread by deposits in wildlife feces. This is an annual grass, growing 15 to 70 centimeters tall, with thin, branching stems that are naked and wiry. These wiry stems make the grass hard to cut. The inflorescence is an open panicle with very slender, spreading branch-bearing spikelets at the tips. The spikelet is 1 to 1.5 centimeters in length and has rib-like longitudinal veins. North Africa grass is at Kamiak Butte now. How prevalent do you think it will be huh, in another 10 years? Amensalism is one participant harmed or impeded and the other is neutral or positively affected. Huh, look at this field. What is growing there? The primary hypothesis for the astonishing success of many exotics as community invaders relative to their importance in their native communities is that they have escaped the natural enemies that control their population growth. The natural enemies hypothesis. However, the frequent failure of introduced biocontrols, weak consumer effects on the growth and reproduction of some invaders, and the lack of consistent strong top-down regulation in many natural ecosystems, indicates that other mechanisms must be involved in the success of some of these exotic plants. One mechanism may be the release by the invader of chemical compounds that have harmful effects on the members of the recipient plant community. That is allopathy. Centuria diffusa is an invasive Eurasian forb in western North America. The primary rationale for considering allopathy as a mechanism for the success of invaders is based on two premises. First, invaders often establish virtual monocultures, where diverse communities once flourished, a phenomenon useful in natural communities. Second, Allopathy is important in recipient ecosystems because they are more likely to be naive to the chemicals possessed by the newly arrived species. They have no natural defense mechanisms. So when a fight happens, they lose. Name all the relationships you can see or confidently predict. These are the ecosystems you need to stand in. Look around. See through the named woodland type to understand where we see trees shrubs, grasses, and mosses, and lichens. You know that looking deeper, there will be mycorrhiza as well as many other fungi interacting here. Just because you cannot easily see it, it does not mean it's not there. Look around. Those deer droppings did not magically arrive. They were dropped while you were not looking. Each species, animal, plant, fungus, and more, are interacting all the time. Competition for space, food, Water, sunlight, and air happens right here. Name and know where you stand. Yeah, you got it. 